And let's jump into the panel one, the realities of institutional shareholder behavior. And I'd like to introduce Mr. Marco Becht, the, uh, the moderator, who is the professor of the finance and economics, a resident fellow at the European Center of Advanced Research and, and Economics and Statistics at ULB, and also the executive director of the European Corporate Governance Institute. So I, I leave you to introduce the panelists, and then please go ahead. Okay, my name, sorry, it's a bit loud, maybe can you turn down a little bit? Okay, thank you. So my name is Marco Becht, and I'm here to represent the ECGI and to moderate this session. Um, it's my first time in Lithuania and uh, Vilnius, uh, and I walked around the town uh, this morning. Uh, I have to say that I'm getting old by now. Uh, in 1988, I was a conscript in the German Luftwaffe, and the only thing I knew about uh, Lithuania was that it was part of the Red Hordes with Kalashnikov rifles. I was conscripted uh, to keep on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Now, this is a bit more than 20 years ago. Uh, I think everybody who's been here for the first time has seen how much progress we've made visibly and how much in 20 years we've achieved uh, and how the world has really changed uh, to be a better place. So I think I just wanted to say this to put our little conference in context and also thank the organizers because uh, the presidency and especially uh, the people who organized the conference have done a really wonderful job. Uh, so that up front. Now, uh, let me turn to the subject of the uh, panel. Uh, the title is The Realities of Institutional Shareholder Behavior. Now, we've talked a lot in the last, by now, four years about banks and how they have not behaved really very well. Uh, now, uh, institutional uh, shareholders have not behaved optimally either. Uh, so we shall talk a little bit about them uh, as opposed to banks. Now, I have uh, two colleagues here with me uh, to do this. Uh, I first of all have David Jackson. Um, he is here really representing two experiences. First of all, he's the company secretary of BP, so he has a lot of experience with uh, institutional shareholder behavior in practice. But interestingly enough, he is also, he has another ego, another personality, which is that he has experience as uh, a trustee on the BP pension fund. So he is also uh, somebody who sits at the right at the other end, namely on the board of an asset owner. Now we also have Tao Li. Uh, Tao has just graduated from Columbia a University uh, and he uh, was on the academic job market. Uh, I don't know if, if you know how this works. Uh, there is a global market for talent uh, and he's produced some of the best research uh, in corporate governance last year. He's in particular produced one piece of paper on proxy advisors, uh, which has gotten him a job at Warwick University. Now, one um, thing that ECGI tries to do is to bring young talent, certainly younger than me. <laughs> I don't think he served in the Chinese uh, Air Force. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, and uh, to bring young talent and, uh, uh, to an audience and uh, to this audience of corporate governance specialists. So he's going to present us his research uh, on uh, proxy advisors. Now, what are the particular topics we are going to discuss? Well, first of all, we will start by talking uh, about uh, the institutional investors who are really behind everything, which is the asset owners. And asset owners uh, have uh, not a great history on their behavior in uh, corporate governance. It was already alluded to by Torben that they, are, uh, they have read finance textbooks, so they understand about diversification. But with diversification, great diversification also comes at the price that they're not really very interested in any particular investment that they make. And you can go across the spectrum. It doesn't really matter whether it's pension funds or whether it's insurance companies or whether it's USITs. Uh, they all follow more or less uh, that pattern. Then there are oddballs. Torben mentioned them. You have foundations. You have financial holding companies. They're a bit different. But broadly, asset owners are just not very interested. Now, another thing that they do is that since they don't really do uh, stewardship uh, themselves, uh, they do something that is quite natural in these situations. They outsource 
uh, the asset management and the governance. And then it gets interesting, intriguing, and quite complex. So I have a little slide for you here. Professors can't do without slides, I guess. Uh, you have the beneficial owners uh, there at the top in pink. Uh, the choice of color is purely random. Uh, so you have them up there, and then what they will typically do is they will outsource both the management of the money but also of the governance to an asset, ma asset management firm. And you know the leading firms, the names of the leading firms in the UK, being it, be it the legal general or I saw a representative of BlackRock uh, is going to speak tomorrow. Uh, you know the names of these asset managers. Now these asset managers then have a choice. Uh, they can either do the governance in-house and you know the teams that BlackRock and the legal in general and the others have, they're typically small teams. Or what they can do is they can further outsource. And there are other service providers in the world that will do this. We have the Hermes EOS service. We have governance for owners. We have several service providers who will provide you with stewardship and governance services that they actually provide to asset managers, but not only. They would also happily provide it to uh, the asset owners as well. You then, of course, have the people we're going to talk about uh, at length with Tao, which is the uh, proxy advisors. Uh, they also offer these governance services, and asset managers outsource to them. Now, the company has not appeared anywhere yet. The company only appears sort of two layers later, because we then have another layer in between, which is the custodian, because the shares must be somewhere held. Now, the custodian in this uh, does a thing which complicates matters. They hold these shares not individually, but in omnibus accounts. So when you actually try to see who the asset manager is, you don't really see them. But you will see JP Morgan, who holds, you know, I don't know how many shares, but actually behind that are asset managers and beneficial owners, and you actually don't know who they are. Now, you then have the vote execution. There is another layer in between the custodian and the company because somebody comes and actually executes the vote, and this really then links in with clearing and settlement, and, uh, you know, who are these people? Then in the US, you have Broadridge, so another level of complication. And then finally, at the end, at the bottom here, you have the companies who have to deal with all of this. Now, there are some issues related to this. Uh, first of all, what should policy do now uh, to make the beneficial owners behave more actively? The Americans have done, certainly for pension funds, something that they think works, which is they have mandated them uh, to vote. So there's a regulation that says that they must vote, uh, and they do. But then, very often, what they do is they call in ISS, and they say, OK, we've voted. Now, they don't really think very much in that way. Now, another thing they can do is, of course, is um, uh, they go to the UK, and then we have Chris Hodge, who's in the room here, and then you get the stewardship code, and because there's a code and comply, to, comply or explain, the problem goes away, and they suddenly start behaving like stewards and monitor and do all these other wonderful things that are written in the code. Well, I'm being a bit provocative. Uh, now, the asset managers themselves, they are conflicted. Uh, they, there's a market for them. Uh, are beneficial owners really willing to pay for corporate governance services? So if an asset manager tries to stand out by saying, we provide better monitoring, better governance, will that get them more business? Uh, this is uh, something that we shall see. Certainly, some of them are trying to stand out um, by doing that. There are specific issues with proxy advisors. Uh, we, the SEC has been on to them in the US. ESMA had a consultation in Europe. They are very controversial, both from the side of the uh, asset management industry, but also from the, side, from the point of view of the corporations. Uh, now, ESMA has recommended that they write their own code, so they're going to go the UK way. Uh, but before we pass judgment on this, I think we want to hear a little bit more about the U.S. experience and what we know about them in the U.S. I think the U.S. here is extremely relevant because the U.S. is the largest market, and that's really where the whole market of ISS in particular is. So whatever happens in the U.S. Uh, has ramifications for us in Europe. And I now turn the floor to Tao Li uh, to tell us about the experience with proxy advisors in the U.S. Tao. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, uh, Marco, actually. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, flying all the way from San Francisco. Um, as Marco mentioned, I will briefly uh, discuss my research on proxy advisors and their role in corporate governance. Um, but the focus here will be on the U.S. market, but uh, you know, there were many implications for the EU as well. Um, so. Okay, I guess a lot of people in the room are familiar with uh, proxy advisors, so I probably shouldn't spend a lot of time on them, but uh, these are third-party advisors that uh, help institutional investors how to vote on corporate governance issues for their portfolio companies. Um, they usually provide the research reports for individual companies, and they give uh, voting recommendations on top of the reports. You know, it's a yes or no recommendation for, um, for those uh, proposals from companies. And it's a buy or pay business model, meaning that uh, institutional investors who purchase the reports and recommendations pay for the, for the, for the fee. And the fee is usually uh, uh, based on annual subscription so these guys have become really powerful in recent years. There were a number of reasons why they became uh, so important in the market. Um, one thing that there's steady growth in institutional uh, ownership and the fiduciary, fiduciary duty um, uh, around the globe. Um, you know, as Mr. Sorensen mentioned, that uh, those institutional shareholders, their holdings is very dispersed. They usually hold, uh, you know, uh, around one percent or two percent of of uh, shares within a particular company, and they don't have the resources and the incentives to do uh, voting research themselves. So they tend to outsource to those um, um, proxy advisory firms, and also the rise of shareholder activism again actually uh, put more pressure on those institutional uh, sh shareholders. And in the U.S., there was an important uh, SEC rule came, uh, coming out in 2003 requiring all the mutual funds to disclose their voting records. And this also triggered um, <clears throat> a lot of demand for those uh, proxy advisory services. Um, in some countries, including U.K., U.S., and some other European countries, Additional banner uh, items like uh, say-on-pay votes, you know, these are becoming popular and uh, a lot of shareholders are re relying on uh, those proxy advisors for those votes. Okay, um, these guys are important. As I said, let me just give you one uh, quick example here. In 2002, um, ISS, which is the leading proxy advisor, it uh, endorsed the HP and Compact uh, merger and that was widely thought as the most important um, uh, factor in uh, winning shareholder support. Without their positive recommendation, the deal would fail. And of course, um, this merger was a disaster later. Um, and even at one of the uh, largest global companies like ExxonMobil, around 20 to 25 percent of the votes are casted automatically. Um, in accordance to uh, proxy advisors' recommendations. Now, they're so important. Are there any problems in the market here? Are they doing a good, good job here? Let me give you an example again, the leading advisor ISS. Um, it actually advised 26,000 companies globally last year, but, uh, um, and uh, uh, for recommendations, that was around uh, 250,000 recommendations. And, and also, 75% of these are within the, um, within the proxy season, which is from January to the June. Uh, you know, with an, um, um, only 180 analysts, are they doing a good job? I mean, a lot of these are just checking boxes. They have some kind of uh, um, very strict um, rules, you know, if, say, um, the board has more independent directors, they always give a, a check. So um, there's some issues on that. And also other issues are like lack of transparency. Um, although they say that we have this one size fit all rule, but they, of, they also say that, oh, we do it case by case. So sometimes shareholders are actually uh, confused. 
Also, they don't have fiduciary duties to, uh, to their clients. Their uh, recommendations are uh, deemed as opinions, just like uh, you know, credit ratings. These are opinions, so they don't have uh, any duties to, uh, to clients. And in this talk, I will focus on potential conflicts of interest, which is that some of the firms, they provide services not only to investors, but also to the companies that investors own. So, you know, potentially it could be more friendly to, to those corporate clients. Okay. Um, so here, ISS, the dominant advisor, it uh, serves um, institutional investors on one side, and on the other side, it also sells data and the consulting services to corporate clients. And one concern here is that since they get a large profit from their corporate clients, they might be you know, more friendly to, to, to those corporations. Uh, actually, last year, the, the uh, ISS had around 25% of the revenue from their uh, corporation side, but their profit from, from that business is over 60%. Um, there's a, a competitor, a pretty large competitor, which entered in 2003. It only serves uh, institutional investors. So this gives us a pretty good setting, kind of a, a, a natural experiment, see how competition would actually affect the incumbent advisor's behavior. Okay, um, so the, the SEC in the U.S. actually, you know, was concerned about this potential conflict of interest I mentioned. Uh, they cited a, uh, a report from GAO, says that corporations could feel obligated to subscribe to ISS consulting services in not to ob ob obtain favorable proxy uh, recommendations on their proposals. And then there are some other, other uh, report on that too. Now, in the, in the EU, the ESMA uh, regulator and the, uh, the AMF regulator in France, they're also concerned about this potential conflict of interest. They issued some white papers on possible policy uh, options. Um, so here, uh, the questions are pretty simple. First, I ask, do um, those corporate clients of the uh, proxy advisors receive more favorable recommendations than their non-client firms, you know, given everything else equal. And uh, theoretically, there's this uh, simple trade-off between consulting revenue and uh, their reputation as a good advisor. If their consulting revenue is really big, so maybe they could be biased you know, when um, they, uh, they, they do recommendations for their corporate clients. Um, also then, second, I, I ask whether competition would actually mitigate this conflict of interest if it really exists. Now, this is not uh, obvious um, um, in the beginning because competition in a parallel industry, a credit ratings industry, it's actually bad. You know, more competition would lead to ratings inflation because companies could shop around for ratings. So if there were more guys in town, you know, they, they actually could actually get uh, a better price. A better price means a, a more inflated rating. There were a couple of papers on that. Um, now, the crucial difference between uh, the proxy advisory industry and the credit rating industry is that here, uh, in proxy uh, advisory industry, it's a buyer pay model. So, you know, um, more competition could be good because uh, with more with more competition, meaning more information uh, flowing from, uh, from, uh, from the company to shareholders, you know, shareholders are more, more in, uh, informed and that, that could, uh, um, could be good. I, I would show later uh, why that's the case. So the finding here is that the new entrant, Glass-Lewis, it actually reduces the incumbent advisor's positive recommendations for management proposals. Okay. So, um, I got a bunch of data from these two advisors, like their uh, institutional clients' holdings, number of companies covered. Uh, most importantly, I got their recommendations for Russell 3000 companies, which are the largest companies in the, in the U.S. Um, they have a combined share of around 98% um, um, of, of, of all the equity holdings in the U.S. 
So I look at annual and special uh, meetings for management proposals, like uh, direct elections, executive compensation, etc. And uh, um, so voting recommendations on each item, usually it's, it's for and against, but for direct elections, there's also a withhold item. And the sample is pretty large, over uh, actually uh, uh, 4,800 unique firms. So I also supplement that data with some stock price and accounting data um, and governance information as well. So I first see that if you know, those uh, voting recommendations have a large influence on, on, uh, on the share outcomes. And the second, I look at whether the effects of competition actually um, leads to a convergence of recommendations from the, the two largest uh, uh, proxy advisors, and I found Yes, that's the case. And the interesting thing is that the direction is the direction which um, which uh, the fraction of different recommendations drops is where the leading guy says for and that the new competitor says against and, and, and withhold. But it's not the opposite direction. So um, that's pretty interesting. And um, and also I, I I further show that. Uh, um, the, the leading advisor actually makes uh, fewer positive recommendations uh, for management proposals when the new competitor begins to cover the firm. Uh, just quick summary statistics. Um, for instance, um, for uh, say on pay proposals uh, in, in the US, the leading advisor ISS actually had around uh, uh, eighty-eight percent of uh, positive recommendation, and uh, the uh, new competitor ha has around uh, uh, seventy-nine percent. So it's tougher. And the investors, when they vote, you know, they, they um, actually vote ninety percent of the times for for those proposals. So potentially, you know, that could be uh, due to due to. Uh, um, holdings uh, by the directors and the management. They often vote um, you know, with their own proposals. OK. Uh, so let's see if uh, these uh, voting recommendations really matter here. Now, if we look at the say on pay proposals again, a positive recommendation from ISS actually is associated with um, actually around 24% more votes. And for Glass Lewis, the new competitors, it's around 13%. For direct elections, you know, it's uh, kind of similar for ISS, around 22%. For the new guy, it's smaller. So overall, overall for a company, um, uh, on an annual basis, it, the correlation for ISS is over 20% uh, between the uh, recommendation and the, the, the vote outcome. So that's pretty significant. And also, ISS influence has been declining over time while the new competitor is becoming uh, more influential. In terms of market share um, of the new competitor, it's uh, growing over time. It entered in 2003, and in 2007, you know, they got a big boost. Uh, actually, they got a lot of clients from pension funds in 2006 and 2007. So then they stay there. Now it's even bigger. Uh, I, I think this year their uh, share is around uh, 45 percent, which is based on client assets. Um, <clears throat> so let's see whether competition matters here. Uh, here I don't prove that uh, you know there's a, a definite conflict of interest um, directly because of data um, constraints, but let's see whether competition would matter. Um, to some degree to the, uh, to the uh, ISS recommendations. Now, what we see is when um, the new competitor's market share increases by 10 percentage points, this difference between um, their recommendation for, for the company actually decreased by around uh, 1.7 percentage points if we control for other company characteristics. This is an overall measure for for the company's proposals, you know, company will come up around 10 percent of, uh, sorry, 10 proposals every year. So some of the proposals we see a bigger 
effect, some of the proposals we see a smaller one, but overall, you know, this 1.7 percent point is the, um, is the number. So some people may, might ask, oh, maybe this is just due to the new competitors um, loosening standards, not the uh, uh, ISS, the incumbent guys, tougher standards. Now, is that, is that true? So what we see here is that there's a decline trend of different, differing recommendations when ISS says yes and Glassnode says no. However, there's no clear pattern the other way around. So if this effect is um, mostly due to Glass-Lewis uh, positive uh, recommendations, then we should see a, a trend going up this way, right? But we don't see that. <clears throat> okay. Now, based on that, I do one more thing is that I look at whether uh, coverage by the new company, by the new advisor, actually has a direct impact um, on ISS recommendations. Um, just a quote from an uh, executive from uh, Glass-Lewis says, when we get a new institutional client, we have to make reports for all the firms in their portfolio. We cannot choose which firm to cover. So, uh, and, and also, when, uh, b before they get a client, before they get an institutional client, they don't know which companies are in their portfolio. So, um, so it's coverage of a new company is likely to be unexpected for ISS, the incumbent advisor. So what I found here is that uh, when, um, when the new, new advisor, Glass Lewis, um, covers uh, a company for the first time, ISS average for recommendation decreases by two percentage points. Now, what does this imply? Is this number big or small? It's just two percentage points, right? But um, remember that this is this is um, um, an overall number. So ISS potential uh, conflict of interest should be mostly concentrated on their corporate clients versus um, their non-client firms. But this number is based on corporate clients and the non-client firms uh, together. So if, if we look at uh, their corporate clients only, this number pops up to around 7%, which which becomes very significant. But, but I cannot show you formally here because I have some, some legal issues with them. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so in this paper, um, I look at uh, potential conflict of interest and the effect of competition among these proxy advisors, which are really important in the corporate governance market. They, uh, they actually advise trillions of dollars um, of assets both in the US and in Europe. Um, what I found here is that there's a convergence of recommendations when the new advisor's market share rises. Um, and, and also, I show that uh, ISS, the incumbent advisor, actually makes fewer positive recommendations to management proposals when the new, uh, when the new advisor begins to cover the firm. So, as I said, I don't test directly um, its conflict of interest because um, of data constraint. So, so ultimately, why this is important? Because, because of their outsized um, influence in the market. It's a pretty tiny market. You know, some people probably haven't heard them, but uh, um, there were just the two large advisors advising trillions of dollars um, globally. And if there's a conflict of interest or some, some, something else that's wrong with them, then shareholders might suffer as a result. So um, if you are interested in further reading, you could uh, refer to my paper, which is uh, posted on SSRN. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tal, thank you very much. Uh, David, do you want to comment? I'm very pleased to be, not very pleased, I'm delighted to be here in this beautiful city, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come along. Um, Tao Li has raised a number of issues, and it's, uh, with all these things, it's a bit difficult to know where to come into this particular debate. I just want to spend a couple of minutes, if I may, trying to join up a few dots, because we've had, in the session before, 
a vision uh, of shareholders and their engagement and activism, almost what I would call the Swedish model. And we've now looked to what I call the American model. And I think just to set the context, just let's look across the whole spectrum, because what I think we're talking about here is the shareholders are the owners of the company. And what we're seeing is varying amounts of delegation given by the shareholders to the board to do various things. And the previous speaker spoke about family companies and private equity, and in many ways there, you've got the shareholders are actually on the board. They are not delegating that much to the board. As you move to a more diverse model of ownership, then the, the issue of delegation comes into place. And in the Swedish model that was being explained earlier on very well, uh, the shareholders have delegated so much, but they've retained the ability to control the board through the nomination committee. If you then look at a UK situation, the shareholders don't appear on the nomination committee. The directors have to be presented for re-election every year, but not quite in the same way as they would do in the Scandinavian model. And between board meetings, the current board can appoint directors. And the US model is very much driven, is similar to the UK model, but is very much driven by the fact that in, in, in the US, in, uh, shareholders are very much looked at themselves as investors rather than as shareholders. And therefore, their behaviors are somewhat different. And indeed, if you go back down that chain again, what you've then got is the, 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 the ability to be active in a US model it, it will appear in a different way. You hear about proxy battles, but what you don't hear about is derivative litigation. Because one of the main ways that corporate governance is changed in the US environment is through derivative litigation brought by shareholders, often at the behest of lawyers, and you end up changing governance within a company by settling the derivative litigation. So one mustn't forget that, and needs to see that whole spectrum. So where do the proxy advisors and where does activism fit within all this? I always think of it in two ways, because there's two sides to this. There is the engagement side, which is the conversation, the dialogue, and there's the connection. And there's the voting side, which is really where the engagement gets put to the test. And the proxy advisors really come into the voting part of that work. And I think uh, Tao Li's work is very, is very interesting from a, an American point of view, because you do see the, the tension between ISS and Glass-Lewis. What you then see when you look into Europe is that here you've got two organizations which are basically selling a product and they are bringing their methods into jurisdictions that don't quite work in the same way. And therefore you see some of the tensions. If I put my pensions hat on rather than my company secretary's hat, BP Pension Fund is worth about 18, 19 billion pounds. Uh, it's not one of the largest pension funds in the UK, but it's pretty large. Um, when we look at our investments, we actually are very strong in equities, uh, but they're a global equity portfolio. And therefore, what we need to do as responsible investors when we look at our UK stocks, for example, is determine the best way forward to uh, approach this. Now, we see, our, see ourselves as informed, I suppose, rather than active owners. Because um, in another body that I sit on, in fact, I chair something in London called the Shareholder Voting Working Group, which is actually focusing at the moment on uh, trying to work out the plumbing around the, the slide that Marco put up with all the complexities of custodians. And one of the conclusions that has already come out of that group is that voting costs money. So someone's got to pay for this voting. And what tends to happen as you look at all this voting is that people want to do it as cheaply as possible. And therefore, you end up with different behaviors as a result of that. But come back to the pension side. Um, we don't have a large team of people who look after the governance side of things. We have an in-house investment manager. We don't uh, 
uh, delegate this out to an asset manager such as legal and general others. We have an in-house team and they are certainly there to, to, to manage the investments. But one of the uh, features, if you like, of the UK system is that in addition to ISS and to a latter extent Glass-Lewis, you have, we have four other proxy advisors. We have the National Association of Pension Funds, the NAPF, we have the Association of British Insurers, the ABI. We have PERC, the pensions, I can't remember what the PERC stands for now, which is very bad, but I just know them as PERC. Uh, they basically advise all the local authority pension funds. And we have an organization called Manifest. All of those different groups have their own corporate governance guidelines, which would say to their members how they would expect them to vote. And therefore, um, this is really a, 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 the history of investment within the UK, that the, the long-term investors uh, still are, but to a lesser extent, the insurance companies and the pension funds. So they were being assisted by their own groups of people. And BP's pension uh, fund is a member of the NAPF. The NAPF actually has a relationship with ISS in the UK, and therefore we, we will follow what ISS does, except in certain cases. And we as a board will determine what companies we actually want to take a special interest in where we won't just slavishly follow ISS. So I think the, the role of the, of the proxy advisors is, is important uh, and it is, pro, it is possible to, for there to be some conflict around it. But equally what I would say, and it's different experience in different markets, in the UK, you can, you can talk to the proxy advisors. You can talk to ISS. They will come along and speak to you. You can talk to the ABI. You can try and talk to PERC. Um, you certainly can't talk to Manifest. And you can't talk to Glass-Lewis. So when you're looking to see how your vote comes out, you're trying to, under, to understand which, where all these different advisors are going to come in and what effect they may well have on your bigger, on your bigger shareholders. Because um, as we may get on to, shareholdings become more diverse and simply just to say we want long-term engaged shareholders means you're covering a very broad spectrum. So I've probably gone on too long into a similar question, but there, shall I pass it back to you, Marco, and we'll see where we go from no, there. I, I, think, uh, I think that's very good. The, um, uh, I, think you, uh, I think you gave a, a new perspective uh, on this. I mean, in fact, what Tao said is that if you have more competition, it might actually be good because more information mm. comes out. Yes. I think what you've said is that not only that, but these people have different instructions and they work for different yes. sets. So it's, qu it's, it's quite different to mm. the it's quite different uh, to, to, the, to the US. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the other topic that we uh, I think we wanted to tackle um, was the relationship between the asset managers and the asset owners. Uh, so you said that you do uh, a lot of the asset management in-house, but uh, if I understand you correctly, the governance is then actually outsourced to somebody else. In essence, yes, and uh, the, with, with certain restrictions. I mean, I think it's you know, back to the fact of... As I, I'll step back one. There's two sides to this, as I said before. There's voting and there's engagement. And one of the main areas about engagement is actually the dialogue that takes place between companies and their shareholders. When you have a very large register um, I mean, and very diverse register, no one company on the BP register has more than 3 or 4%. So you're very, very spread out. The Exxon example is quite an interesting one because Exxon actually have nearly 50% on their register of retail shareholders. There's nothing like that level of retail shareholding in the UK. Exxon is almost a stock because everybody has to hold it. It's in most of US investors' portfolios and they have a very, very strong um, retail shareholder base. Uh, and that's actually quite true of, of many other companies. If you look at the BP register, we still have the largest ADR program in the US, really because when we merged with Amoco uh, in 1999, Amoco had a huge retail shareholder base, so we have a lot of ADRs that we have to, shareholders that we have to look after. Um, so as, as you rightly say, the, 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 um, a lot of the 
uh, governance is outsourced. But I think what you're seeing in the UK is that the, a, a number of the asset managers, uh, whether they're the, the legal and generals or the Black Rocks or whatever, uh, used to do, very much used to work off their own bat, and they, they, they tended to decide what was the best thing for the companies in which they, owned, that they, they were holding the shares. I think there's a lot more pressure now coming on these asset managers from the asset owners. Um, and actually, part of it's as much to do with what was being said earlier on in the earlier session, which is that the asset owners are looking to get value. And so they're interested in actually saying, well, you're managing this investment for us, but are you, are we, are we, are we, are you really getting the value out of it? And are you really holding the management of these companies to properly to account? Do you understand what their strategy is? Do you understand where their long-term value is? And that then brings out another um, piece of the, the involvement in the UK, that you can often be having two sets of conversations with the same shareholder. And the way this works is that um, we, we, for example, do quarterly earnings. Um, I wish we didn't, but we do, so we do quarterly earnings. So we have an, an analyst conference every quarter, and at the half years, the chief executive and the finance director will go out and see a large number of shareholders, possibly covering 40% of those who own us, uh, both on both sides of the Atlantic, in Europe, and they'll talk about the financial performance of the company. There will then be separate conversations which the chairman will be involved in. And I will go with the chairman and we'll go and see a number of our shareholders and they will be interested in what the board is doing. And they're saying, well, we've heard what your chief executive says, we've heard what your finance director says. Now, what are you as the chairman, how do you, how do you think about it? What's the board's view on strategy? Uh, how's the chief executive doing? What are you thinking about board succession from a non-executive director point of view? How are you looking after reputational risks? How are you looking after environmental risks? And they're very, very different conversations. And what's quite fascinating is you can have different com conversations with the same shareholders. And the executives can come back and say, hey, everything's fine. They get the financial message. We're really happy. And then we can come back saying, I think they're a bit unhappy at the moment. <laughs> and this is where th 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 there's, it may be joined up in the company, but quite often within the institutional shareholders, they're not joined up because the sort of governance and SRI people work on one uh, uh, path and the analysts and the investment side work on another path. So just on the shareholder dialogue, thinking about market abuse directive in that direction, I mean, how fair disclosure, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do you handle this? I mean, you give, you give quite a lot of private information, soft, well, no, not private information is the wrong word, it's a legal term. You give a bit of soft information to shareholders who come to see you. How do you make sure that everybody gets the same information. Well, you, what you're doing is... I guess in the, in the US, that's a major concern, that if you talk to some shareholders... No, it's, in, the, in the US, it's used as a reason for not talking to shareholders. If you talk to the lawyers, they'll say Regulation FD isn't as vicious as everybody says it is, and it's purely used by the companies as a reason for not talking to shareholders, because they don't want to talk to the shareholders. So it's and in, and in, the, in UK, the UK, it's not a problem. we don't see it as a problem. And in fact, it's, I mean, one of the challenges you've got at the moment is that if you go back to, um, oh, by the way, so let me, let's be very clear. We do not give what I would call uh, inside information or anything that Obviously would require not. an announcement or anything like that. So let us be very, very clear about that. But I believe the regime is suitably flexible for you to have sensible conversations Meaningful about conversation. non-market sensitive issues. Um, but if you come back to the UK again, and I talk about delegation, um, at the beginning of this month, uh, as a result of government legislation, part of the delegation given to a British board has been taken away. Um, but by that I mean that the old delegation that a board used to have to set the pay of the directors has now been taken away. And it's been replaced by the fact that the board must go and seek uh, from the annual general meeting, from the shareholders, uh, approval of a, pro of a policy within which pay is going to be set. And that now has to be, it can be a three-year policy. And the important thing about that is that um, 
although it will come to a vote at the meeting, the intention of everybody is that pay, packet, pay policies won't be voted down. In other words, there will be conversations between the companies and their larger shareholders in, in, in advance of the meeting so that any problems can be ironed out. The challenge that the shareholders have got is there's a lot of companies and there's a lot of waterfront to cover. So they're actually contemplating, and I was at a conference uh, actually organized by ISS only two or three weeks ago, uh, <laughs> uh, which where, where we were talking with a number of shareholders about could they, could they work in concert to come and talk to companies and have a, 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 a broader conversation. And I think companies would be receptive to that. Um, the problem is what companies want to know at the end of the day, and if you come back to engagement and voting, the engagement's all very well, but where are the votes going to be at the end of the day? You can have a very pleasant conversation and understand that people seem to be with you, but they then don't vote as you, perhaps you thought they were going to. But let me come back to something you said previously. You previously said voting costs money, which is obviously true. Uh, now, this kind of dialogue costs even more money. Mm. So you as the pension fund trustee, are you willing to spend, I don't know how many more basis points to have these meaningful dialogues? I, th I think you're, you're into the interesting question that um, where does your duty as a trustee stand with regards to spending the, tr the basically the, 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 pe the beneficiary's money at the end of the day? And I think you have to balance this. And I think what we do is try and balance it in such a way that we, we, we take an interest in the investments. We try to be as active as we believe is necessary, but we carry out our duties by working within basically one of these groups, which is the NAPF, and following their recommendations. I mean, would one thing, one thing you could do, I'm just... Uh thinking aloud. I mean, how much diversification do you need to be diversified? And, uh, do you really need to be have hold 20,000 companies or 2,000 companies? Is 100 not enough? I guess Investor AB have maybe 20 in the portfolio, but then you know they spend serious amounts of money to monitor those companies. Mm. Maybe that's too little for the BP Pension Fund, but you know maybe 100 uh, would be more manageable. Is 100 not enough diversification? Well, as I you said, could then uh, concentrate the money on actually having a meaningful dialogue? Uh, I think the, the, the challenge is that the, 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 it isn't just UK equities. UK equities is part of that. It's the US, we're in the, well, the East, could have Japan. A worldwide. I mean, you know, and then, then do we have to set up uh, organizations in, in the US and in Japan and in each country in Europe where we hold the shares? I mean, it becomes a, uh, a never-ending issue. So I think one has to say, the right balance at the time. Now, other let's, let's be clear. You know, other other larger pension funds take take a view. Someone like the Univi University Superannuation Fund, USS, are very active. They've got a team there. They're a bigger fund. Hermes, which is the, the BT fund, they are much more active in that area. They've committed more funds to it. But even they, and I think, are starting to find some challenges in this. And the other challenge they've got is, frankly what size on the register do they have? Because when you're, in, when you're engaging in a diverse world, you're tending to talk to, at least reach out to the top 20 shareholders most of the time. And if you look at the way which our registers changed, what we haven't talked about is the sovereign wealth funds. We've the, deliberately not talked about <laughs> but, but if you look at our register, in the top 10, we've, top 20, we've got the Norwegians, the Singaporeans, the Kuwaitis, and the Chinese. And there you've got real long-term investors. They are with you, come rain, come shine. How engaged they are is another matter, but well, they are uh, long-term investors. Well, I remember <laughs> that we had conferences about sovereign wealth funds uh, just before Lehman collapsed. Then sort of the topic went away, but I guess it's coming back now. The consensus at the time was that governments met uh, in uh, South America to decide that, in fact, sovereign wealth funds would not be active in governance in order to avoid uh, certain yeah. states who promote some of these funds not to become active in some strategically important sectors of Europe, uh, like yogurt. Um, anyway, so I think that was the, uh, there was a real concern that they might become too active. I understand that, but all I'm saying but is you fact, have to play the game, the ball in front you, of you. Uh, today, I mean, they are certainly uh, 
but if you look at their problem, I mean, they have, I guess they have exactly the same problem as BP, the BP, I mean, the BP pension fund. Uh, how are they going to justify to their beneficiaries uh, that they are going to spend, I don't know how many basis points on governance and dialogue? I mean, in some sense, the belief is that the state uh, is in a better position to spend money on governance than a privately governed uh, organization like a pension fund or an insurance mm. company. But in fact, they have exactly the same problem. I think we're going to have, I mean, looking at this purely parochially as a UK point of view, I think we're, we're embarking now on a quite an interesting experiment in terms of remuneration that will, I, we, we will learn over the next two years probably a lot more about what the realities of uh, engagement, dialogue, the efficiency of the voting chain and various other things are um, through this period because it's, it's, sorry, it's probably, probably the wrong way of looking at it, but, but engagement over the next 12 months, it could be a bit like speed dating, I think. There will be a lot of companies wanting to meet a lot of shareholders to find yes or no. And I think that's where we're sort of heading down this track. Um, and it's going to be an interesting experiment, I think. Um, but, but we're only looking at one particular model, which is the UK model, which I'm familiar with. But as we've said, there are other models, Swedish, there's, there's boards where you've got two-tier boards, you've got different in relations with your shareholders and your owners. And um, one just needs, I think, to be able to see, see it in the right context. I think that the way in which the, 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 the voting agencies at the moment work, it, work, it doesn't work too badly in the UK because I think there's, a, there's an understanding of what people's roles are and an ISS vote or ISS determination is probably, um, it's fairly balanced. I think most practitioners in the UK would say because you can engage with them. What isn't balanced is things like Glass-Lewis because you can't speak to Glass-Lewis. I mean, we've got one, I mean, one of our directors always gets a no vote on, from Glass-Lewis because he was on the, the City Court board, albeit he came off it before the financial crisis. But because he was on the board, he gets a cross against him. And so you get those sorts of reactions. Glass Lewis will also say, unless you've attended X percent of the board meetings, you get a cross against you. Uh, the fact that, and I mean, if you use our examples, over the last three years, given what we've been facing, when you've been having 25 board meetings a year, uh, to miss the occasional one isn't a bad percentage. If, it, if it's one out of 25, it's one thing. If it's one out of seven, it's a different matter entirely. But no one's interested in that. Mm -hmm. So well, one has to be quite careful that some of these proxy agencies are just literally applying a, a template and then voting accordingly. Now, let me get back to the point of the remuneration uh, of you know, remunerating either asset managers or asset owners for actually uh, meaningfully, I mean, doing stewardship. I mean, let, me, let me put it this way. Uh, so one thing that has been suggested is, is to cl create special share classes where those who actually engage with the company or engage in stewardship, mm -hmm. uh, where they get a higher dividend or uh, some kind of uh, more uh, a higher cash flow uh, right, mm. because what they're really doing is a public service. And if they engage in a dialogue, uh, it's to the benefit of all the shareholders, including of those who don't do anything. I mean, that's the public, mm. uh, that's the public good market failure problem, really, uh, behind, uh, behind the yeah. stewardship. So uh, one solution could be that you create a special share class uh, where people who do engage in these dialogues get a higher dividend. I know that's very not even, one shouldn't even mention this in the UK because one share, one vote and all this sort of thing. But actually from an economics point of view, that, that would make sense. What would uh, be your reaction? Well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's there. I remember sitting in a, in a meeting with, in the, in, 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 with, 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 with three government ministers who were fretting about what had happened after Cadbury had been taken over by Kraft and what could we do to ensure long-term ownership. And I said, well, you can do whatever you like. I mean, we've got two sets of shares at the moment. We can change the articles. We can reward. We have absolute flexibility under UK company law to go down any route you want to. The people who don't actually want it are the shareholders. There's more feeling against it, I feel, from the uh, 
the institutional shareholders because they get more worried about it than the companies do at the end of the day. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile. Well, there needs to be some way of trying to encourage longer term ownership. And I know John Kay is very keen on that. I, I think you know, it, one, one can look at these things. I'm, I'm not hugely... In, what one does want to do is to introduce complexity into an already potentially complex system. So one just needs to be careful about that. But if there are appro appropriate economic incentives, then I, I'm, I, I wouldn't rule, rule them out and certainly well, would examine you're a BP uh, pension trustee, so say that, uh, you know, British Telecom, I'm not saying BP, British Telecom, uh, would approach uh, the pension fund and say, we want to create a separate share class. We pay you X basis points a year more for these uh, preference shares. But in return, we want to see you twice a year. Um, would that be something that you might consider? Well, I, I, as I said, I'm, I'm open to considering all, all sorts of things. I think it's, 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 it's what... Uh, well, because, 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 because I, no, when, I, when I say that, I mean that actually quite sincerely. Because it's a point that was made again by the earlier speaker. We keep looking backwards. Corporate governance for the last 10 years has been about fixing the past. What we don't do is look forward and say, where do we, what, are, what role a company's going to play in future? How do they fit in with society? How do we want them governed? What sort of shareholders we, do we want for those companies? And how do we incentivize those shareholders to remain long term? So I'm, the, the reason I'm open to it is let's have a visionary view of it and look forward rather than try and sort out all the problems of the past. Okay, so I think we have, um, we have 19 more minutes. So I would like to bring in uh, uh, the audience. Now, if you don't participate, I'm going to do MBA style. I know some of your names, and I'm going to ask you personally. <laughs> okay. Christine brought that is laughing. You'll here, be the first it? one to be asked. <laughs> INSEAD style. <laughs> okay, any questions? Yes. If you could please say your name and affiliation. There's a microphone coming. Thanks. Hi, I'm Julie Bamford. I'm from the Institute of Charter Secretaries in the UK. Um, my background is as a company secretary. Um, going back to the issue of proxy advisors, um, I'd, I'd like to hear from both David and I'd be interested to say if he was interested in doing any more research. The problem that UK companies find very often is they have the dialogue with companies, and I know David alluded to the fact that the corporate governance people uh, or the analysts and the conversation between the analysts and the chairman can be different. But companies will engage with their shareholders directly and explain all their circumstances and have their shareholders absolutely on board and with them. And that's the understanding they go away with. And then when the voting is passed to a proxy voting agency, it goes through the formula from the template, as we say, and the votes don't match. So. In, companies in the UK are very frustrated that whilst they're having this dialogue with shareholders and moving towards this model where we have this dynamic conversation, but the votes don't reflect that. And it is important because obviously it can be a substantial part of the vote. And I'd be interested in if you, to know if you'd be thinking about doing some research on that. I, um, I must say I've not seen it as a result of them delegating it to the proxy voting agencies because the, the people you normally have the dialogues with, they would normally say their policy is that they would look at, say, ISS, but then they would uh, have an educated view of what they were going to do as a result of that. Um, I'm, the problem I see more is that you have the, the dialogue and you don't ask the question, well, are you going to vote for us? you sort of assume you've had a good meeting, and then you find out later on that they haven't voted for you, and they haven't had the courtesy to tell you that they're not going to vote for you, or they're going to withhold the vote. So I've never seen it quite as being the, 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 the proxy agency sort of turning around a piece of engagement. Normally, if you've engaged, then normally they've given the instruction or they've taken control of it. Now, where this all works in the chain is a much more interesting issue which we could spend the whole afternoon on because how you how a vote gets from point a to point b works in one of the best japanese just-in-time systems in the uk i've ever seen 
it, because it finds its way there, but it only finds its way there 48 hours before the meeting. And your ability then, if you've found there's been a vote against, to do anything about it is precious little. And that's another issue that we're trying to, trying to resolve. But I, I must say, I don't see the, quite the same problem. Tom, one of the striking things in your presentation on this point was just how powerful the for or against recommendation of either Glass Lewis or uh, ISS is in the US. It's 20 percent, right? Yeah, yeah. So could you just elaborate a bit on the statistic? Yeah, I mean, so is this... Uh, yeah, so the correlation is actually above 20 percent for ISS. If ISS says, oh, you know, you guys should vote for it, there will be around 20 uh, percent more votes for the proposal. And for Glass Lewis, it's smaller, but it's still above 10 percent. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I, um, so if we can contrast the U.S. case with the, with the U.K. case, I mean, personally, I'm not as familiar with the U.K. environment, but in the U.S., uh, as, as David said, that uh, the communication between shareholders and the companies is actually not as good as in the U.K., so a lot of investors would just listen to those um, proxy advisors. So, um, so there were some cases that uh, initially the advisors say um, investors should vote for the for the proposal. Then later, you know, the companies change their proposals, and then there would be a reverse of the uh, recommendation. Then shareholders would actually also change their 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 voting. So. Um, so, especially smaller investors, they listen to those advisors almost 100% in the U.S. So. Okay, can we have another? Susanna. Hi, Susanna Hahn, European Issuers. Just a follow-up question on that one, because I think in the U.K. with the disclosures under the stewardship code, you see that of ISS clients, I think about 60% follow their own policies. So of that, then 40% would follow, if you like, ISS own recommendation. Mm. I'm guessing that if there's no stewardship code in the US, you can't tell what the breakdown is at that level within the US market. So you can't tell how many of ISS clients have their own policies. Is, is the question clear? Uh, Not very. <laughs> uh, could you actually repeat? Um, In the UK, yeah. stewardship code disclosures, the fund managers disclose whether they use the ISS recommendations or whether they have their own voting policies mm -hmm. sort of put through the ISS system or whatever. And I think, from memory, but perhaps the FRC can correct me if I get this wrong, I think it's about 60% of the client's own policies. Okay. So I'm just wondering whether there are any statistics for the US market as to what... No. No. Yeah, in, in the US, those uh, uh, investors do not disclose um, which guidelines they follow. They often say, we have our own guidelines, but it's, it's often based on ISS or Glass-Lewis uh, guidelines. So, you know, I was trying to, to get uh, which companies, oh, sorry, which investors are those clients, but they refused to give me the statistics. Uh, Tao's uh, been recruited by Warwick University. You'll get this research uh, soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, can we have another question? Patrick. Comment or question? Patrick Zosras and uh, ECODA. Uh, my question is addressed to Taoli. Have you researched the governance of ISS or, or, or Glass Lewis itself and how the work of the analyst is framed, guided, uh, organized? Who has, at the end, um, a, as a group of person or an individual person, the power of orienting the recommendation of the analyst? You mean at ISS or, 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 or Glass-Lewis, who has in their organization, is it, is it a board, is it a committee, is it a group of person, is it purely what you say, the process, uh, ticking the box inside their, their operation, 
But uh, when you speak about ISS, we, we have a, a hard time uh, seeing the human person judgment behind it. Right. Right. I think it depends on the shareholder. Um, you know, especially smaller shareholders, they, they, they rely more on those um, advisors, ISS and Glass-Lewis. For larger shareholders like BlackRock, um, you know, or, or some other larger uh, shareholders, they have more resources. They have, say, BlackRock has around 20 people in-house who deal with voting issues. And uh, for the ones they don't think that important to them, they would uh, outsource to ISS or Glass-Lewis. But for the particular uh, proposals they're interested, they would spend time doing research themselves and actually vote. Um, in, in that way. Uh, just, just a couple. Oh, you mean inside ISS? Uh, well, yeah, inside ISS, they have analysts. They have a bunch of analysts doing doing research, and then there will be a director, you know, um, uh, responsible for 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 those uh, uh, analysts. So um, then. <clears throat> then actually there's, uh, there's a consensus uh, reached, you know, which recommendation should be for that proposal. So, is it clear or? I, I, I think also if I, just from the UK practice, they, you, you, they, they have definite analysts for different parts of industry. So you let, we, we can phone up our ISS analyst before the season starts and start talking to them then about some of the issues that we may have, and they welcome that. ISS are also linked to the NAPF, so ISS have their own set of voting recommendations or their own governance principles, so do the NAPF, and the two tend to merge. And I think I know informally that sometimes ISS will talk to some of the NAPF people in the UK to see where the general view of some of the shareholders are before they put their recommendation in. And companies can be talking to either to ISS or to the, NA, or the NAPF or its members. So it's still um, somewhat done in a bit of a smoke-filled room, but at least there's a bit more transparency with it. What's actually happened, though, is because ISS is predominantly a US company, they keep rolling out products. And last year, they rolled out a product called QuickScore. And on all of the ISS recommendations in the UK, probably globally, they gave a score on four different criteria. And the score on the criteria was done in the US, and the voting recommendation was done in the UK. And we, I actually had a, quite a direct conversation with some of the ISS people in the States, because just challenging where they got their data from and why it didn't uh, tie in with what was happening in the UK. And basically, there's two, two hands and two sides of the same organization that don't necessarily talk to each other. You talk to the UK guys, they were saying, well, we have to put it on. It's seen as a bit of product, uh, additional attraction for the product by our US colleagues. But frankly, you read what we say, don't read what they say. So, but, but, but unless you're sort of informed about this, you might wonder where the two things came from. So you know, they're a big organization. They need to get their act together in some way. But having said all that, I still find them quite good to deal with them, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't denigrate them completely. Yeah, um, and, and sorry, and, and actually on top of that, I should add to that, uh, those analysts from ISS or Glass Lewis, they analyze each individual proposal, you know, with the information available uh, from these companies. They claim that they only use publicly available information to avoid uh, conflict of interest. But, uh, but as David said, that ISS does engage with those companies. So it, it could get some information from their discussion with, with the companies, and actually um, the recommendations could uh, result from that. I, I mean, I mean just, just so people understand this process, they, they will send us the draft report. So will the ABI. So do PERC. So this is not sort of people just firing off stuff into the, into, into the darkness. They will send you the draft reports. They will have a discussion with you about them. How much of it they what you say takes on board is a matter for them. 
but there is at least a process. You, but Glass Lewis will not send you their draft report. No. They just publish. So I think there's a difference. So I can take two more questions. There's a gentleman in the back, and Carmine. Hello, and the name's Patrick McGee. I work for the UK government managing our state-owned enterprises, but <clears throat> until last year, I was a corporate stockbroker advising BP and other list, UK-listed companies in terms of the corporate governance. Um, I just want to challenge Marco on whether we really think that there is a failure, a market failure in corporate governance, because the engagement process that David talks about is very live and you know, if we start creating two-tiered shares, we're going to have lots of people running around having conversations because they feel they need to, and we're going to end up in the circumstance where the, the speaker earlier talked about more and more rules and regulations actually clogging up companies creating value. So that's a personal challenge rather than a UK government <laughs> challenge. But having worked with cor listed companies uh, for the last 10 years, I don't see signs of a failure of corporate governance. Okay, I don't have any statistics to challenge you. And we know anyway that everything works in the UK, but I can say the continent, you know, we still have homework to do. I think I can say with confidence. Got me there. Yes, Carmine Di Noia, Sonime. Actually, also, maybe my question comes from uh, what Marco said before, but it's a question for, for also the others. I mean, are we going, you, 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 you proposed this, uh, this idea of uh, basically rewarding for engagement. Now, are we going stewardship. to... Stewardship. Stewardship, yeah. So are we going to a world where, you know, vote, engagement, others is, I mean, becomes... It was a right, but more and more becomes a duty, and this may be the idea also of regulators. It is worth, in the end, for final clients that all this money is spent on engagement, maybe vote, uh, maybe proxy. Actually, proxy, is a, you impartially already answered, is a strange market because they are, in a sense, competitor, but in many cases, uh, asset uh, uh, managers may actually have the services or the advice of both uh, or even more uh, proxy advisors, and actually you may wonder, if I outsource to them because I don't have the resource, why then I choose more than one? Because then I have to choose which advice to follow. So, I mean, I'm, uh, is it worth all the money spent on this? Shall I have a go? Okay, Carmen thinks we spend too much money already. <laughs> okay, well, <so> good. <laughs> I think you've got to pick your model, basically. And you either have regulation or you have a shareholder system. Because the question that was asked, certainly during the banking crisis, was as much of where were the shareholders as where was the board. Why had the shareholders in, for example, RBS, voted in favor of the deal and allowed that to go through? Now, different countries, we're back to this other issue, I think, of different countries approach boards shareholders in different ways. In the UK, we've gone clearly down the route that we don't want to have SEC-type regulation. We want to have shareholders who have, have, have rights but also have duties. And that's, where we're, that's the model we're using, and that's where the engagement, the, cons the, cons the, uh, the consultation, and the voting comes from. I th still think if you look at the US, even though they have a say on pay, it is a much more regulated uh, environment from that point of view. I mean, you know, if you, if you want to bring a, a resolution to an AGM in the US, you have to have the SEC's approval for it. So, you know, whereas in the UK, as long as you pass certain criteria, anybody can bring a, sh a resolution to the AGM. So there are different models. So it may be that you find investors or shareholders say, actually, we don't want to go and play the game according to the UK version and have all these costs of voting and all these things, we'll go and play in other markets where they, they have different systems. But I, I think what we're just reflecting is the, the, the bed we've particularly made and that which we're lying in at the moment. Tao, last word. Yeah, I guess, you know, in the US, some investors 
um, especially larger ones, they would rely on, on more uh, outside resources. They would uh, buy uh, products from ISS and Glass Lewis as well. So they, they probably have some other advisors advising them. So yeah. yes, it, it is a lot of money, but, uh, but potentially that could be useful. Okay, the Lithuanian presidency likes to run things on time. <laughs> we finished on time. Thank you very much.